me a huge favor and give Mark a big round of applause and let's get started here. <laughs> picture. I really do. <laughs> I've recycled that bitch a few times. So what's up everyone? How y'all doing? Everybody good? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. This will be different. You guys are not getting graded on this. Um, so I'm not going to bore you like a bunch of your professors who actually don't have jobs. I actually have a job. So I want you to get out of this what you want to get out of it. What is that? I don't fucking know. <laughs> That's why the presentation is just so I can, you know, hone in on my PowerPoint skills, go over a little bit of my past, what I've done, <laughs> what I'm doing, how I got here, um, that's all background. That's cool. We get warm and fuzzy with each other. You know, I like warm walks on the beach. I like a lot of cool things, right? That's great. That's a bunch of self-indulging bullshit. I'm not interested in that. I'll blaze right through that. Just give you my path to how I got where I was, um, where, I, where I was and where I'm going and where I am. Um, once we get through that, I'm going to give you some tips. Just a tip. Um, I'll give you some tips on what I believe a successful entrepreneur should be doing and what your best path to success is. There are so many different paths to success that my path might be different than another person. Hell, you might get some Trump money and have a million dollars to go do whatever you want with. Me, I have nothing. So obviously my way of getting to where I'm at is different from someone who had even grant money from you. You know, because we didn't have this cool program. So I'm gonna just say if you can, get involved with this organization, because it seems pretty badass. And. Uh, Again, it's, it's a resource that uh, you need to take advantage of. And again, um, everybody wants to be a CEO. For those of you who know bodybuilding, Ronnie Coleman's favorite. It's tying in the whole meathead thing. I got to do it. Um, but ain't nobody want to do no hard-ass work. And that's what this is all about. You heard that little motivational speech, Eric Thomas, I believe? Of course. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it's just how bad you want it. And I'm going to get into this way further when we get going. But what usually separates the great CEOs, there are some people who get lucky. You might see them. They might work two hours a day. They're worth $20 billion. Well, there's outliers. Like, can you play basketball like LeBron James? No, you can't. You're probably not going to fucking do that. So for you, if you're stupid like me or just normal, it's going to take a lot of work. Like he said, you have to sacrifice sleep to get to where you need to go. I'll tell you what, I've been in the emergency room three times due to exhaustion from overworking. And honestly, I'd hate to say that's what it takes, but in a lot of cases, that's what it takes. You can have the best idea in the world. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't matter. Because you can have the cure for cancer unless you tell people about it. Nobody's gonna know about it. It takes the grind. It takes work. So here's me. This is self-indulgent bullshit. Again, that's a beautiful choreographed family picture. What you don't see is the kids were crying five seconds earlier. I was about to kill everybody and bury them in that forest. But nonetheless, at that very moment, everyone was smiling, doing their thing. Um, and I'm very, those are my, my, as you can tell, I have a thing with LeBrons. Um, I, I'd wear these to a fucking wedding if I could. Um, so I'm the chief marketing officer at TigerFitness.com, CEO of MTS Nutrition, Ethitech Nutrition, um, two separate companies handling two separate ends of the market. Ethitech's commodities, MTS is more um, formulated high-end items. What you'll find in marketing, and we get in this later in the positioning section, positioning for marketing, not sexual positioning. <laughs> Although we could get into that in the Q&A, just saying. Um, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, you can't be everything to everybody. So that's something you look at. Uh, partner in Rivas Clothing, we just launched that this year. We also have a company called Headlines. You'll be seeing that soon. Again, self-post like, launching things. And machine training solutions. Um, essentially what that is, I used to coach people. I still have a few clients. Um, it's a personal escort that I can write things off on. You'll learn about taxation and how to avoid it later on in life. Um, what I did before this, I was the former owner of Cybation and Private Force. We pioneered the intra-workout category with Extend. Not the, again, everything's sexual today. <laughs> Not the penis thing, although I, would, I wish it worked for that. Um, but that's why I wear tight pants. But, uh, but you know, the intra-workout product. Before that, I founded a company called Instone with Sylvester Stallone. While that failed miserably, it looks really cool on my resume. Um, before that, I was with Weeder Publications, American Media. American Media purchased Weeder Publications. Um, a lot of people don't realize I worked in corporate America for five years, did very well. In fact, my highest earning year was 2003 when I worked for someone else. And I also just made myself look really fucking old right now. I'm a pro bodybuilder, a very lackluster one at that. And I should have changed that to retired pro bodybuilder because I just can't balance it all. Um, husband and father of three, and 
star and epic failure in episode three of American Grit, which I just put there because fuck it. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so here's where we get into my beginnings. Again, I apologize for this, but Brad told me to throw this in there. It was in your email. I can pull it up right now. So my mom was, so I'm a first generation American. Mom came here with no money, nothing, just like $7. One of those stories gets to Staten Island. I don't even know if my name's spelled correctly. You know, one of those where you just come over here with a dream and you want to have those opportunities. Opportunities that America lends people that no other country does. And no matter what our political climate, whether you like Obama, whether you like Trump, whether whoever, this isn't, look, I'm not fucking Chelsea Clinton. I realized she was here yesterday. <laughs> I'm not stumping for anybody here. I'm just saying this is still America, okay? And when my mom came to America, it was to fucking make it. All right, they wanted to make a difference. Not they had it terrible where they were. I mean, they were in Israel at the time when they came over. It's not a third world country, but America's great. So um, she served in the Israel military, went back, served, um, and then moved to USA and was an entrepreneur. My mom um, came here with no money again. She started out, she, I still can make these cookies are delicious. They were called, it was called the Gookie Cookie Company, which opened a store in Simi Valley, California. Did really, really well um, for a cookie, a retail cookie store. You know, you can only do sell so many 99 cent cookies, you know. Um, but my mom did really well, you know, came from nothing, completed two years of college, didn't really know English that well when she came over here. Um, started out with the hustle. That's where I learned my hustle from my mom originally. I mean, she worked in the bakery all hours, I mean, 20 hours a day, opened up the, re you know, just sold the local businesses B2B and whoever would buy them, and then opened up a retail store and continued her B2B hustle. So she really um, showed me hustle. I remember um, when I played Little League, she used to dress up as a chicken and go hand out cookies and flyers and samples. I mean, she was, a, she was an old school hustler, you know what I'm saying? She hustled. Um, you know, so basically, um, I worked in the store from the age of seven to 10. Um, unfortunately, like with a lot of sad stories, um, which you know, obviously at the time it sucked, my mom's a drug addict, so we lost everything. Um, Pretty much everything. So we had that American dream, but again, like you're seeing in the Midwest, the heroin and everything like that, my mom just got caught up. So that's where my, my life got a little weird at the time. Um, but I do like to think that the impressionable years, which are basically between zero and 10, I was instilled that work ethic that I carry with me to this day. And uh, Honestly, there's, there's, I think that's the last picture I have of my father. He passed away when I was 22. Um, so I was a young buck right there. My brother had some hair at the time. I still have my hair. He doesn't. But he's 6'1", so it's just still unfair. So anyway, so my father worked for the government. Had the same job for 27 years, although in a very um, subservient, not really a, an alpha or a go get him position. He did work his way up to supervisor. Um, he traveled a ton, probably 200 plus days a year. Um, and here's the story I remember most about my father. Obviously, him coaching my Little League teams, um, which I carry to me to this day. My father was a, a genius when he came to math, which I suck at math. I mean, I have a CFO and a calculator. I can't fucking add for shit. Um, but I mean, my dad would know the batting average, the on-base percentage of every kid on every other Little League team by heart. I mean, we won the championship every year. He beat them with math. It was insane. But I remember one day I woke up, I was probably, I think I was 10 years old, and I had to pee. And my dad was already dressed, had his shirt and tie, which, you know, he had no swag. But it was, it was, it was okay, he did his best. And uh, he was, I remember getting glasses, I remember, I just remember drinking apple juice, and this is how detailed it was. And he's like, all right, gotta go to work, love you, bye. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, it's 4 a.m. All right, cool. So my father was a loyal individual, and, uh, Basically, the employee you want in your company. Um, well, my mom was crazy. Literally, certifiably bipolar crazy, batshit crazy. I think I got the positive aspects of that without the uh, mental institutions and the drugs. Um, so anyway, uh, so long story short, we ended up moving to Inwood, California. Which, as you could probably tell, I don't look like I belong in Inwood, California. I'm not sure if my parents looked at like the demographics of Inwood, California, but nonetheless, I loved living there. Um, I got into some shit, you know? Um, when you lack family at home, what gangs do, if anybody, any psychology people here? No psych? Cool, that shit sucks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
But basically what a gang is, any, any gang bangers? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. You know, there could be a narc in here. Um, what, what you do when you, when you lack family unit is you look for it, and that's what, that's what that gang does. So I ran with the wrong crowd, um, so to speak, did some shit. Um, luckily, I have one dude, Coach Miles, um, a six foot four, 300 pound black guy who bench 405 for 30 reps, who took me under his wing. And he, myself, and this dude, Leon Hatton, we trained. And football and training for football saved me, literally. Got me on the right path, um, got me on the way to school, um, I had tons of anger issues, and that really helped me work it out. Uh, football taught me leadership skills. Ever here play a sport or has played a sport? I'm guessing, you guys look athletic as fuck. Okay, cool. Now, sports are amazing. They teach you leadership skills, they teach you teamwork, and sports, I think, combined with that early on glimpse of hustle, um, got me kind of the ethic I needed to get to that level. So, at the end of the day, my mom had a drug problem, my dad was dying, he had type two diabetes, led to strokes, I mean, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, he was in bad shape the last probably five years of his life. So I just had to get out. It's that fight or flight. You can either fly or you could die. And uh, I decided I'm not gonna die. So I got school done early and um, I hustled my way through it. So I graduated high school, all that. Got a little, I, I injured myself before I could actually play a down in college, but it at least got me some financial aid and scholarship to get through college. Um, so anyway, I already said that shit. I memorized this. But that's a cool picture though, right? <laughs> Had to show you the picture. So when I got into like college, I'm 17, I liked fitness. So I went to a gym, Valley Total Fitness. They're out of business now. They, they sold Valley Fitness. I mean, they, they went chapter 11 a few times. And I got a job as a trainer. And I needed money. So I, were, I took as many hours, as many of the cheap free, they used to give you these cheap like $9 an hour clients. And you start out, it was $11 an hour to train people and they made like $50 per session. But as you got certified, which I literally got like a month, I got A certified, um, you were making 21 hours. So I'm making $21 an hour, worked 40 plus hours, and I still didn't have enough money. Um, and I had to send money to my parents, they were struggling. So I helped them with money. Um, and I wasn't living on campus anymore, so I had rent, so I had, to get, I had to get more money. So what I do, I was already working 40 hours a week, taking 20 units, do the math, okay? And so I got a job slanging shoes part-time at Big Five Sporting Goods. Not good shoes, I'm talking fucking LA gear. Y'all even know what LA gear is? I'm aging myself again. Basically, they made a shoe called the Michael Jacksons. Y'all anybody here remember the Michael Jacksons? That had the zippers? Nobody, a 50 Cent song? Like the Michael Jacksons with all the zip, okay. Um, okay, anyway, so I just, I worked, man. And that was the first time I went to the emergency room. Um, I literally was exhausted. And uh, I, everything was kind of, my, my digestive system was going, my immune system was failing, but I had to get it done. It was literally what I had to do. Some people be like, oh man, I need some assistance, I need some government aid. I'm too proud to take that shit, I really am. So I was working with clients to afford $50 a session. Normally people have some money, Simi Valley, a lot of, lot of people with money. So I was working at Weeder, I was working at Valley, got approached by the senior VP of Weeder. I thought he was a child molester. Came in my office, I had a, a Valley, the Simi Valley location. At that time I was overseeing a few clubs. And um, he goes, have you ever read Flex Magazine? I'm like, oh God, I'm pervert, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I got it right here in my bag. I'm like, but this is retarded because who the fuck does this many sets for triceps? I should probably try it because my triceps suck. Um, so anyway, he's like, look, we, I think you'd be great for this job. He knew nothing about me, but he heard from somebody, again, don't, we're gonna get into relationships later you know, business relationships, work relationships, private, whatever it is. But he didn't know anything about me, but he said, you should come in and interview for this position. It was for endemic ad sales. Endemic means within the industry, basically selling shit to supplement companies. Um, I'm like, cool. I didn't own a suit. My father had an old suit. It was about 12 sizes too small, but I wore it anyway. So I went in there and I got the job. And I remember during the interview, his name was Bob Washburn. He asked me, do you think you're cocky? I said, no, I'm confident. Cockiness means that you can't deliver. I'm gonna deliver on everything I say. So I started in ad sales. The first time I got a commission check, four months, I was working 18, 20 hour days. They handed me a $30,000 territory. I turned that shit into $3 million almost immediately. I had no idea how commission worked. They gave me a sheet. 
I just knew I had to work hours, and the more calls I made, the more people I visited, the more I traveled, the more money I'd make, and or the better I just couldn't just sit back and let it happen. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm 20 years old, and I get this check, and it had extra zeros on it. I remember my wife called me, my fiance at the time. She goes, "Hey, you should, you, you can't take. They, they, they messed up." So I went into my boss a lot of time. I'm like, "Bro, you fucked up. I'm like, can't, can't take." He's like, "No, that's that's your check." I said, "Are you serious?" It was like triple what my salary for the year was. It was retarded. So I paid off all my school loans, you know, put it all away, and that's how I started. So long story short, AMI, American Media, who owns the National Enquirer, the Star, Country Weekly, Mira en Español at the time, I think they still own all that stuff. Um, they actually purchased Weeder, and I was promoted to corporate ad sales. Um, I was getting topped out, bored, and uh, I was just approached by the guys who uh, were starting in stone with Sylvester Stallone. So I took that job, and as a shareholder, I'd say that's where I became an entrepreneur. So <laughs> the take home from these three things, because again, this is self-absorbed, but why am I going over this? What's my path? Again, everybody has a different path. I recommend everybody, now you might have a great idea, but it's, fi it's fine to start, there's a difference between a, having a product and having a business. And I think it's always good to work for someone else before you throw it all, because entrepreneurship is dangerous, why? 94% of all businesses fail. So you're going into an arena where potentially you have experts. And if you go into business, make sure you know that business like nothing else. Become an expert in every area of the business that you're in. You can ask me any obscure, stupid fact about anything within the industry, and even dealing with training. I don't train people, but I still spent a week last week um, getting certified my phase two for Exos, which is a high-end athletic training. I don't even do that. But it's part of the industry I'm in. So be an expert at what you do. And remember, there's a chance you're going to fail. A big chance. Would you use a condom with a 94% fail rate? Y'all don't use condoms anyway. I'm <laughs> so, <laughs> so in stone was my greatest mistake. Um, I didn't like working with something companies at the time because they were unethical, they were dirty. And uh, they just, they lied on the labels and they put illegal stuff. At that time you had hot stuff, which put d in it. It was just crazy. So I can't do this anymore, I feel dirty. So uh, the thing about Weeder, um, not Instone, is uh, Gore Technology Investment Group. And I went off on this at lunch, I went off. But there's something about getting money that makes you suck. Every company in this industry, in my industry, that is investment money, fails miserably because they don't have the fucking grind. They don't grunt. They don't know what it's like. They're like, well, we got an extra 10 million. I'm like, why don't you just grow organically and build it? It's a more sense of ownership, you know? So the CEO is just a douchebag. His name was John Arnold, and you know, I still want to punch him in the face. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, I got fired because I said things no one else would. They wanted to deal with GNC on consignment. Hey, we got a million dollar sale. Yeah, but you're not getting paid for it. It's all gonna be set back. No one's gonna buy this shit. Oh, you're wrong. I'm like, ah, you're bankrupt. I'm still rich. Fuck you. Okay? So, it, <laughs> that was so fucking popping. Well, it's true, though. I mean, all these motherfuckers, John just got fucking uh, reamed by the, I think it was the FCC or FTC or something for some infomercial stuff he does. It's just a douchebag. You know, we're putting, but what it did, you just got to make the leap. That was my time to become a, an entrepreneur. That was my time. I had security. I made a lot of money at Weir. I was able to take that leap. Okay, I was able to take that calculated risk knowing that it probably would fail. Because looking back, that was a stupid business move. I, know, I knew at the time it would never, never um, <coughs> create what I wanted it to, but it, gave, it, made me, for, it forced me out of my proverbial box. So, and entrepreneurs are mentally challenged. They're, they're risk takers, they're stubborn. Um, anybody who goes into anything knowing there's only a 6% success rate is absolutely insane. Insane. I would use the condom analogy, it's been done, I'm out. I have nothing else. So I just copied this shit from LinkedIn. At the end of the day, um, we did a lot of cool shit at Cybation. We launched a company from zero, started with a product that we didn't even have after two years. It was called NeuroStim, it was a brain product. We actually did pretty well with it at the beginning. Um, we were fortunate enough, uh, through trial and error, to launch the intro workout category and popularize it. And creating a category is the single best way to make a ton of money because you're creating a category first to market, first to mind. And we're the first ones to put intro workout BCAA out there and make them taste not like ass. And people say, 
you know, people, I, I make this joke all the time. It's like, well, BCAA, you know, why couldn't they flavor it before? I'm like, BCAA tastes like ass, but I actually eat ass. So, <laughs> I'm just trying to keep y'all's attention. I know it's been a long day. That could be true. Um, but anyway, so consistent sales growth year to year, um, benchmark of quality. We had a great practice what you preach. First one is to really get on board the message boards and promote what we need to promote within that. And again, we were utilizing media that no one was really utilizing at the time, which were the message boards. And again, the, the money shot is the intra workout category, which unfortunately after a year of having extend, Extends came out, which was the Ron Jeremy uh, penis growth product. Funny story, well for me it's funny, and I'm here so I'm just gonna say it. Um, I used to drive a, a Xterra that was wrapped, said Extend across it, and every truck stop, dudes come up like, hey dude, you selling that penis growth stuff? I'm like, yeah bro, you should see it, you know? I mean, what do you say to that? I mean, why deny it, just roll with it. Let's go like, yeah, you see the before and afters. So those two people who watched American Grit, there's my picture. All right. You can't tell that, you know, from the waist down, I'm freezing. It was terrible. Actually, I was freezing everywhere. It sucked. Um, I sold Salvation in 2011. Um, people ask why, and I always say when you sell a company, you move on. And you don't, you sign an NDA, and you just don't talk bad, you don't talk good, you say, look, I wish them the best. And I really do, because that company was a lot of my blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of people helped build it. It wasn't me who built the company, that's the one thing. You don't build a company, your team helps you build the company. I know. I'm not a socialist, but I do believe within a company, if you don't have your employees, you fail. Okay, you fail miserably. So I teamed up with Tiger Fitness at a two-year non-compete, but I could sell a house brand. So we basically um, circumvented that uh, non-compete by selling MTS Nutrition only at TigerFitness.com. Um, how I met the CEO of Tiger Fitness, Chad, my best friend and partner, um, I sold to him. You know, um, I would use one of my accounts. And uh, it was just a good situation. We didn't have a house brand. So our first thing as a company, and this is something we'll go into later as well as now, is positioning and differentiation. So the one thing we did, we were the first ones, bodybuilding.com copied us with Jim and the other lines to have an autonomous sport nutrition brand within a website with its own identity, believe it or not. Supreme did it with the bars, but at the end of the day, there was no autonomy. Everybody knew they were connected, but we were completely separate from separate books, separate everything. Completely autonomous company. And of course, bodybuilding.com preaches over eight billion served or whatever. What's the opposite of that? More than just a number here. Avis in the 1980s, best marketing campaign. We're number two, but we try harder. They simplified it to we try harder once people understood number two. Not poop, but number two, the number two. Um, so you're more than just a number here is the polar opposite of what they did, kind of like we try harder and really we, we do treat everybody. The thing is you can have a positioning statement, you gotta live by it. If you write a note, we had a note the other day. I want you to draw a picture of an elephant fucking a donkey. Our people drew it. That's just how we roll. And I'm surprised it was a good depiction. And I don't think it would work anatomically, but it worked in the drawing. Um, and, and of course, MTS Nutrition is quality, truth to label, personalized service. We launched our whey protein. There's a lot of amino spiking going on, <laughs> lying on the label. Um, so we are fortunate, even though the customer was unfortunate, that there's a lot of douchebags in our industry. And we were able to position against them with truth, accuracy, and a fair price. Um, and really good taste. Cookies and cream, really, we were able to come out and have a protein that, like Synthesix is, it's a competing brand for those who don't know by BSN. It's only 30% protein. So we were able to come out with a comparably, if not better tasting protein with 80% protein. So it was actually a protein powder, not an MRP. That tasted that good. So positioning and differentiation. These are the two things when people ask me when they start a company, what do I do outside of obviously having money to do it, which obviously the CEO club helps with. Again, I wish you guys were around when I was a kid. I don't even think they had an internet back then. Uh, so the mind can only hold one position, one position for industry. You know, Walmart, even though low price is a terrible thing to compete on because someone will always outprice you. Someone is always willing to make less money than you. They're the low price leader, you know what I mean? Avis tries harder, like we talked about before. Be the opposite of your main competition. I already got, went over that, but again, when you're creating a company within an industry, if their color is red, make your color blue. If their slogan is, we serve a ton of people, say, hey, we serve less, but we serve them better. Um, that's attributed to, if you want to read this book, if you haven't read Positioning yet by Alries and Jack Trout, 
or the 22 Immutable Laws of Branding and the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, also written by Al Rees and Jack Trout. So be prepared to, to grind. Like I said before, you must work all the time. You get no off days. That team no off days is bullshit in training, but it means it in business. I haven't had a complete off day in probably 10. Actually, after I sold Salvation, I took two days off. 94% um, of businesses fail. Let me tell you about some, just some things. Taxes. Ask Chelsea about that shit. <laughs> okay. Taxes are fucked up. We're paying about 50%. Healthcare, Obamacare, rates. I don't know, we're imagine running a business. I do, do, do. We're, we're giving everybody healthcare, right? Everybody's covered. Everybody's getting a high end PPO. Everybody. From the mailroom, we don't have mailroom, we just get our fucking mail. From the shipping to the front office to the CEO to the CMO to the COO, everybody's getting, everybody's getting healthcare. Obamacare, 48% less coverage, 48% increase. That's the shit you have to deal with, all right? Competition. Someone's always, what's that Cuban quote? Like work, work as if someone's working 24 hours trying to take all your shit? Yeah, someone's trying to take you down and the higher you get, the more people are nipping at your friggin' heels. So just remember that. You're always, always fighting against somebody. Holy shit, I even put it there. Um, <laughs> nine to five is not realistic. If you start a business thinking you're gonna work nine to five, you're high. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Because guess what, it's an international economy. So if you own a business like mine, you're gonna be talking to Australia at 2 a.m. If you own a retail store, you wanna work some fucked up hours, open a restaurant. That's some fucked up shit right there. Don't open a restaurant, unless that's your thing. But it's a very, 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 very hard industry to get into. And grind. You know, every path is different. The path that, again, someone like Trump takes with some seed money, that's awesome. If you have that opportunity, do it. You could be an investment company. A lot of people become really rich going public. A lot of people have become really rich taking investment money or loans or whatever. I'm a grinder. Not the app. Um, I'm more of a Tinder kind of guy. Um, grinder's the gay one, right? Okay, yeah, not one of those. Although there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so at the end of the day, I prefer the grind. I prefer hustling. That's just in my blood. I feel lazy if I don't hustle. But again, if, if however your path is, you do that path. You do that path, you do you. Relationships. This shit, relationships got me to the top. My black friend, Mike. <laughs> Explain. Everybody, everybody, I'm not racist, I got a black friend. Um, <laughs> We're actually business partners. We own a company together called Ambrosia. So um, Mike, Mike's a great dude. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you never know who will be the next, the next influencer. And it really doesn't matter who the next influencer is. Just don't treat people incorrect. Treat people good. Treat people nice. Treat everybody like they matter. Because at the end of the day, we're all equal. Some of us might work harder. Some of us might do things differently. But just because you come from one neighborhood, like I grew up at the shitty end, you know? Now I live in the suburbs. Does that make, I'm still the same person, still have the same skin on my body. It's stretched out a little bit. It's bald now. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all the same people. I mean, treat everybody with respect. And from a selfish business standpoint, you never know when that guy's gonna be able to just fucking screw you over. So always treat everybody from the front desk person, the person cleaning the urinal next to you. It's just the right thing to do as a human being. From a business standpoint, you never know. You never know. Relationships build careers. Don't mind. You think people might not like me. I talk a lot of shit. I'm loud, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, I've never screwed anyone over. Ask anybody. I've never screwed anybody in my industry over. And I've never, ever, ever treated anybody below me. I treat everybody the same. Whether that's right or wrong, that's how I've always operated. Always keep your word. Unless you're running for president, then you can say whatever the fuck you want to say. Um, no, always keep your word. If you commit to something, never overpromise and underdeliver. Always give a fair assessment to what you can achieve and overdeliver on that. And um, yeah, um, I've never screwed anybody intentionally. Well, a couple times. I do have a few children. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. That's um, that's the um, that's the gist. 
of the, um, the conversation. Um, I like to leave a lot of time for Q&A because I'm not here to just talk about myself and what I want to talk about. This Q&A session can either be the most lame, retarded, stupid thing you've ever been to where I'm just standing here like, or we could ask some good questions or even shitty questions. Training, all, all that stuff. I listed sexual a few times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that guy, I heard a lot about your school. Um, <laughs> what's up? Oh, it's Madison? Yeah, I should have taken another turn, huh? I actually passed that, I think. All right, so I guess we'll open the floor to whatever y'all want. Again, training, diet, whatever, I don't give a shit. I've already gone through the spiel. If you want me to expand on anything, that's great. What I want to give you is a nice foundation to build some walls upon. So um, feel free, raise hands. Throw stuff. What? What's that? Is it true that you have a, a bed in your office? I actually sleep in my office Monday through Friday. And um, I live in Illinois. But I didn't expect the company to grow like it did. I didn't expect to have to be so hands on. I got to admit, I underestimated. So my company needs me there. So I either sleep in a hotel in Vegas during the week, because our second warehouse is in Vegas. And speaking of Vegas, just to get back to the grind thing, Black Friday is, as you know, for retail, internet retail is the busiest week of the year. So instead of hiring temps, myself and Birdman, who's my, my right-hand dude, I guess, or my boy, I don't know what, I'm his left, he's my right, I don't know, whatever the stranger is. Um, you know, Birdman and me are going out there to help ship in Vegas. Um, Black Friday, I'm gonna be at home on Thanksgiving, but Friday through Wednesday, we're gonna make sure all the orders get out. Because our core proficiency, if we can't get it in your, at your doorstep, we fail. We're a technology and shipping company, first and foremost. So beyond like, everybody thinks I just sit around thinking of ways to make games. You know, if you knew the amount of tech work we have to do on the back end, it would make your head spin. But yeah, I do sleep in my office. Um, it's, a, it's a comfy little uh, fold out bed. It's the uh, casting couch during the day. So, <laughs> um, so it's, uh, yeah, I actually do, which is, it's kind of cool because I got a full <laughs> kitchen and a gym. So it's kind of like my 50,000 square foot house. <clears throat> with security cameras all around, so I can't even walk around naked. <laughs> Seriously, all the time. All right, hands. Yes? Favorite meal for breakfast I don't enjoy food anymore. I just lost my taste for food. I don't really have a favorite meal. Like, I don't get cravings. I like, I this sounds like a selfless, selfless plug, but I eat enough of my protein mixed into pudding where I don't have a sweet tooth. And um, I guess salmon is good. It reminds me of prom night. <laughs> Sorry. All right, this is going to be awkward as shit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. When did you start training? Um, I was 13, and I realized um, the reason I started training is probably different than a lot of people. I actually was decent at sports. I was always good when I was younger, but when you get older, people get better and you don't. Um, I did. And so, um, you know, I was, I was training, just bullshitting one day. I was going into my sophomore year, and I had a coach, Coach Carroll. He was standing there. We were doing our weightlifting. He's like, Lil' if you don't lift weights, you're not going to play a lick. I'm like, ah, fuck you, you know? So I just went on bullshitting. I went home at night, and I know this might not be politically correct, but this is exactly what happened. Um, at that time in California, there was affirmative action. And I was, looked, I was noticing that Asians and whites weren't getting into school unless they played sports. So I'm like, I need to play a sport. I wasn't good enough at baseball. I was like the 10th best man on the team. I played baseball at the time. And I knew football was a sport that if I could just run really fast into people, that I'd be okay. So I just started training really hard and I, I, managed, to, I, I managed to gain 70 pounds. And um, it, it, it took me, my, I went from being a bench warmer on the JV team to you know, starting and being recruited as a junior. Um, just because I trained my ass off. Like, say, I overtrained. Yeah, I literally was uh, six hours a day. And then after training, I'd go run with the basketball team. Because I, wa I, I knew what I had to do to get to my next level. If I, like, like I was saying, I, I went to lunch with these guys, um, and I ate salmon. Um, <laughs> it, is that, I don't, I, I, if I do something, I go balls deep. You know, I can't just put the tip in. You know, um, I had to go 100%. When I decided I was gonna go to college on a football scholarship, I went to college on a football scholarship. There was no other choice. There was no option. I did a cannonball. I didn't just feel the water. I'm like, fuck it, it's cold. 
you know, and that's, that's how I live my life. And I'm not re recommending that for everybody. It's been okay for me. Could have gone the other way too. But I put all my eggs in that bag. I, got, I still got like a 3.2, but I could have applied myself better at school. But again, given what I had around me with the UC mm -hmm. system and the fact they were trying to correct for an imbalance done with the upperclassmen, there was no way I would have ever gotten into school with affirmative action. It is what it is, <coughs> political or not. That was, I knew what I had to do, and that was get good at a sport. And I wasn't gonna do it with golf. <laughs> As you probably saw in my other video as well. Yes? How does the process of starting segregation in MPS compare to the two years between the two and three degrees? Oh man, it was, it was like, um, MTS was pretty much a, I messed up, like I made so many mistakes in my first company. Like there was so much correction that had to be made along the way, uh, from distribution mistakes to pricing mistakes, uh, to a lot of different partnership mistakes. Not necessarily with it internally, but externally who we partnered with, we didn't vet them enough. That it, it literally like half my time was spent fixing what I fucked up. And I'm, the, the thing is if you could look back and like we made them, like just today, I emailed my partner Chad and we had a, an initiative that failed miserably in the last three months to the point we have to correct it. And both of us were like, yep, our fault. You know, you gotta be able to identify, and t the worst thing you could do if you work in the company I, I run, I hate to say work for me, but you work with me, is fuck up and not, if you fuck up, even if it's like a million dollar mistake, go, my bad, cool, just don't do it again. But if you fuck up and you don't fess up to it and you don't say, okay, here's how we're gonna make it better, that's when there's a problem. I'm the first one to say I'll make a mistake. I'm gonna make more mistakes. I'll make a ton of mistakes. We're all gonna make mistakes. However, the best thing about MTS is I was able to start and being that, you know, I already sold a company and Tiger Fitness existed, you know, I was able to focus on the branding and the quality over sales. When you start a company, you have no money and you have no funding you tend to overlook some quality control aspects because you need to make sales. Then you make deals and devalue the brand because you need money. You're like, okay, I'm only making 10 points on this, but this will help pay this bill. Because there were times we're 370K in the hole. As a million dollar company, what are you gonna do? You know, so then you get dealing with bigger money. Then, you're, then it gets even more risky if you're a $20 million company, you know? Then you're like, oh shit. Now I'm dealing with inventory levels. I'm carrying four million on the friggin' floor every minute of the day. Look at that overhead, look at that, look at that liability just sitting right there. So I think the main difference is that we did I didn't have to, I didn't have to fight as much for survival. I just fought to win for a long-term win. And I still didn't take any money or investors. It was all self-funded, it was all generating our own cash flow which is the only way I know how to operate. If you gave me investment money, I wouldn't know what to do. <coughs> I'd be like, what's this? Like we actually had a meeting and this is, um, I'm not gonna mention who, but a, an, an investment group came in. And um, we sat down, met with them for a whole eight hours. Went over our portfolio, we're transparent, here's our numbers. Here's our profit margin, here's everything. And uh, they looked and um, first thing they said, you guys aren't paying yourselves enough money. That time combined, we were paying ourselves less than six figures, my partner and I, and I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, you need to pay yourself like CEOs. I'm like, I'm good. Chad, I'm good. I'm like, okay, this is over. I'm like, if that's your thought process that you need to be at a certain level because everybody else is, I hate sheep. I hate that mentality. I hate being one of the crowd. And I think everybody in the CEO or the entrepreneur club, I think everybody in that club, everybody in this room, because you're here, I don't think y'all like following shit. I think that shit pisses you off. Anybody want to be average? Anybody here want to be average? Average fucking frightens me. Imagine waking up every day. Like, imagine me going to fucking soccer games. A bunch of dads walking around nine to five. They look miserable. They look fucking miserable. Fucking, they can't even dress right. <laughs> Their shoes are not on point. And I mean, no, at, at the end of the day, that's just not me. And, and I think everybody in here, everybody in here thinks the same as me. Difference is, you know, I didn't have this advice and this resource. I had to learn as I went. But you guys are here. You guys are a leg up. Like you guys are on the right path. Just being here shows that you do not want to be like the however many thousands of other kids on this goddamn campus. You guys want to be special. You guys want to do something. You guys want to leave a fucking legacy. And I think that's why we're all here tonight, on your time. 
Your time, my time is valuable, yeah, but I love doing this shit. This is fun. Like, you guys are another guy talking. Like, you guys are investing your time, and I appreciate that. So, yeah, I think this is a group who does want to be special. Not short bus special. But special. <laughs> yes, sir? What's your thoughts on a metabolic adaptation? Metabolic adaptation exists. Your body's a very fucking awesome object, man. I mean, if you're starving, your body's going to show slow stuff down, right? So the goal with any diet or, wow, this, this is a, such a fucking uh, schizophrenic presentation. Okay, let's talk about, okay, now let's go to metabolic adaptation. <laughs> no, I love this. This is what, this, my mind's all over the place too. Uh, salmon. So at the end of the day, there's, there's no metabolic damage. I believe it. It just adapts. So it's pretty much the same thing, just bad terminology. And it does take a lot to get people back out of that. Now with metabolic adaptation, um, I don't think it can happen for normal people. It happens for normal people. Usually people get into the extreme depths of contest prep. A lot of runners get that because their basal metabolic rate from running every day is extremely high. Runners are the worst people to ever try to get into shape because they're already, their body's already adapted to running 10K a day, right? Like imagine that their body's compensating by not burning that to maintain, I don't know, not dying. So your body's a brilliant object, but Generally, you get runners to stop running, that's when they lose weight. It's, it's a profound thing, because you think calories in, calories out. Sometimes it's not that easy. Now, when you get into things as extreme as contest prep, and this is another reason, I, there's no way, people are like, oh, you're a pussy, you dropped out of your show. Man, you ever open a warehouse, sleep two hours a night, and try to get shredded? I could have gotten ready, and judging by how people looked on stage, I think I would have fucking won the show. But at the end of the day, it wouldn't have been my best. I'm not gonna do anything I can't go balls deep on, right? So that's the thing. You're gonna, you, your body will adapt, but I don't think it's damaged. I think you can come back. And some people mistake just having really slow fucking metabolisms for metabolic damage. Some people just have slow metabolism. Some people just have to diet on less calories. It is what it is, and um, it just sucks for some people to get lean. Does that answer that question completely, or you want me to expand on it? Because I'd go on. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Is that what you expected? Cool, I didn't want to disappoint. Yes, sir? Do you prep? Um, do I? I? I sort of. I know what I need every meal, and I'm pretty good at eyeballing. Um, I travel a lot, so for me to have 40 Tupperwares with me to go to Ohio would be a bit weird. I eat out a lot, salmon, and um, <laughs> like today at lunch, you know, I, I have certain things like I'm experimenting because I'm writing a diet book, so I'm trying it myself. I'm writing a new diet for you know January 1st. Um, something I'm experimenting with, which deals with mental and physical aspects. The brain, you know, the brain loves fat. The body loves carbs. So how do you balance the two? So usually I know what I'm eating. The one consistency I have is I have carbs pre and post workout. And I'll usually have some carbs intra workout. Not today, because I just didn't want to carry a big thing of carb 10. But at the end of the day, that's the only consistent part. But I do know I'm getting a certain amount of protein and fat and carbs per meal. But for me to try and meal prep at this point, again, there's a reason I dropped that show. Excuse me, and I used to. I used to be the one, but I got food poisoning seven times in one year doing that once. It was horrible. I, was, I thought I had like some stomach virus, and then the doctor's like, bro, you've just been getting food poisoning every week, because you keep it cool, but then the ice melts, and then you get to some hotels that don't have a fridge, because I was on a huge budget back then, so I'm like, oh shit. So you go and you get the ice, and you put the food on the ice, then in the morning it's water, and then you get food poisoning. And that's how I got herpes. <laughs> yes. When you first got into business, was there like uh, a time when you like, <coughs> met, uh, met like any mentors that like helped you actually work your way up like the corporate ladder, or was it kind of you just grinded and messed up hundred fucking times before you ended up <laughs> learning how to do that, or how did that process look when you got into it? No one helped me per se, but I'd like to say that I had some influencers um, when I started out. Um, I had a professor in college. His name was Randall Donahue. And he wasn't a professor per se, he was a dude who was a marketing guy. And I latched on to him because he understood the game. He was in the game. He wasn't just a guy who got a PhD and decided to profess. He was a guy who went out and made shit happen. And I really kind of, um, he introduced me to Kotler's work, who's a great guy in marketing. Um, so I got with him and um, I learned a lot when I worked at Weider um, as far as science wise. Um, Dr. Jim Wright, who was, he wrote the first book on anabolic steroids. But it's bodybuilding, it's, you know. But anyway, I latched onto him. He was a drunk, so I'd take him out to lunch every other day. He's since passed away, great man, but he used to get, he used, 
I used to spend hundred dollars on that guy every day, but it was worth it because the knowledge bombs he dropped scientifically on me, even while inebriated, at twelve. <laughs> in the day <laughs> was just profound. Dr. Jeff Feliciano, from a science standpoint, from business, had a few influences, you know. Um, even though I don't really like him now, um, there was a guy, Vince Andrich, who told me that basically uh, you can write all you want about science, but unless the consumer understands it in layman's terms, so basically stop saying PPAR and stuff like that and mTOR, people don't give a fuck unless you explain what it does. You know what I mean? So there are a few influencers, but as far as business, I just had to roll. I pretty much had nobody. Um, and that's part of my fault. I was very close-minded. And I don't regret that, but I kind of think I would have done better if I had listened a bit more. So always listen. And I've learned that as I've gotten older. You got to listen. There's a lot of people smarter than me. At least me. Uh, yes, sir? Oh, what's your take on having friends on your business? Well, it can work. Um, Unfortunately, if they fuck up, it's hard to fire them. So as a business owner, the last thing you want to do is fire people. From a business standpoint, getting someone and training them is a tens of thousands of dollars investment, right? To train your system and take your time to do that, just from opportunity cost, right? Um, friends can work. Families touch, very touch, very weird. It can work, but in very, it's an individual case-by-case -case scenario. And, um, if there's two employees who are related in your company, that might work. Um, as far as brother, sister, husband, wife, um, it depends on your school of thought. And Hewlett Packard used to encourage employees to date and get married. Because married people tend to work hard because they have more to lose. Kids, house. Whereas single people, I'll tell you what, if I had kids, I would have never started a business. <clears throat> I'd be too scared. You know what I mean? I would have never done what I did. I would have never taken that risk. So. It is kind of smart in a way to encourage inner office, you know, dating. Um, yeah, but, but it, it just depends on your school of thought. It can be an issue, but a lot of companies encourage that kind of thing. Um, so it just depends on your school of thought. I'm kind of indifferent. I just want the best people on my team. I just want the right people on my bus. Yes, sir? What are your, si what are your systems in place? Because I know you started that um, warehouse up in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Was it an easy transition or was it just? Chaos? It was easy for me because I didn't do the coding. Um, you have, essentially you have uh, Europa who's a distributor. Mm -hmm. So we, their warehouse is literally strategically six minutes from our warehouse in Vegas. So we use them as a warehouse. So all third party brands, we only stock like five brands in Vegas. Everything else we get the same day. So it was, a, it, you literally have to have a system where it talks to five different warehouses sees which is faster, which is cheaper, does a friggin' algorithm, figures out who ships to what order. Every order does that within milliseconds. So I'd say it, it obviously we, we undershot it by four weeks when we'd have it open. And it, it, it was tough. Logistically, having two warehouses is probably one of the toughest things I've ever done. And it's working now, but again, we had our hiccups, but luckily they were minimized. And it took longer, but that's good because we didn't have hiccups. So it's either take your time and do it right, but there's always gonna be hiccups. You just gotta be willing to operate on the fly. That's those things you don't learn in school, like the oh shit plan. <laughs> and like, you know, like, well, what if, what if something happens? I'm flying there, you know, like, like well, what do we do for Black Friday? I'll be there. I'll put on my running shoes and I'll ship all day. We'll make it happen. That's the thing, if you have a company, you know, I love, well, Undercover Boss makes me happy and pisses me off at the same time. On one hand, awesome, you're doing that. On the other hand, how do you not know what the fuck your company runs? How do you not know how to do everything in your organization? You're a shitty CEO. You should be burned at the stake. <laughs> just kidding, that's a little extreme. But I'm just saying, like, if you run a company, you should know how to do everything. You should be the example for everything in your company. Just saying, that's just my opinion. I'm more hands-on, though. Not micromanagement, but hands-on. Because yeah. I will do it if I have to. But if you're doing it, I'm not gonna bug you. I'm like, do your thing. Like, what should I do? I'm like, why are you here if I'm gonna make the decision? You know, it's your fucking, to do it. If you fuck up, we'll fix it. That's how you empower people. That's how they grow within the organization. Does that answer that question? Yep. You were next. Uh, how do you find and build your team? How did I find them? Yeah. It's hard. Um, hardworking people who are career driven, very hard to find. And it's not generational. I mean, everybody goes, oh, millennials this, millennials that. No, it spans all generation gaps. I think people are just fucking lazy. It's hard to find good help. 
Um, honestly, we just weeded out the bad ones. We found the cancers within the company. We found the, um, yeah, I, I like to say that. We found the one um, malignant cell and remove them one at a time. And I think right now we're perfect. But it, basically we're operating with 40% uh, less people. So imagine that. We have 40% less people, yet we're producing twice as much work. Does that make sense? Makes complete sense to me. We had dead weight. Even a company our size, we're not a $70 million company. No, we're not that huge. But we're big enough to have dead weight. You just have to be willing to weed out the bad apples. I know that sounds bad. It's like everybody put paint CEOs in such a bad light. Oh, they're rich, they fire people. I'm like, no, we don't want to fire people. Nothing sucks more than wondering that guy's going to be able to pay his mortgage. Right? That sucks. That sucks. That will make you lose sleep at night. That will make you cry at night. However, you have to do it because you have to sacrifice one because he's slowing everybody else down. And that's another, another thing you have to deal with as a CEO because there is no business and personal. Anybody who does that is an insensitive piece of shit. You need to know your employees. Like Our, our Christmas party isn't at some bar. We're not getting drunk at the Mason Rec Center playing dodgeball with our kids. That's our company. So when we let someone go, it hurts. And we do everything we can to fix that employee. We've done, we've gone above and beyond. We just instituted drug testing at our company, right? We had a guy before the drug testing, had a problem. We paid for his rehab. Technically, we should have probably fired him. Couldn't do it. We did everything we could within the law to keep him there. He's doing fine now. But that's the thing. Employers generally do not want to fire people. I'm not, there are some dicks. There are some pieces of shit out there that enjoy that, right? That get a boner off of hurting people. That's not me. I get boners for other things. <laughs> well, I, I had to lighten that up. That was getting too serious. I was about to cry. <laughs> Talked about boners again. <laughs> Shouldn't be wearing tight pants. Um, <laughs> All right. Yes? So. I know you're uh, a very successful person, but what do you say has kept you grounded? Because there is moments where people can be, become really successful, but their ego goes way up high. But I can tell that you're, you're a person that's humble. So what do you say? You know, humble is a weird term. Where humble is almost saying that you're less. I don't The term humble, I, I think, and I'm relatively successful. There's plenty of people more successful than me. Plenty of people. Um, and I've yet to even realize success that others have reached. And I don't think success is really financial. I think success is more spiritual. Um, even though I'm not religious, I do have a spiritual side to me. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you are where you came from, you know? I'm still the same kid that was doing stupid shit at 16. I just made a, right a couple right choices along the way, and I met the right people. So I didn't do this. Like, I hate that thing, like, that, that whole Obama thing. I know it's old. You didn't build this. I don't know if it was taken out of context or what. That kind of pissed me off, but I built it, but there were supporting factors in my life. You know, I had Coach Miles. Coach Miles hadn't come along and showed me how to lift weights and allow me to grow spiritually, personally, physically, mentally. Would I be here right now? If Bob Washburn would have found me at the gym and give me an opportunity to interview and hire me over people with master's degrees as a 19-year-old, would I have been where I'm at today? Absolutely not. So, I mean, we're all victims. But again, none of that shit happens unless you put in the work. Like, it's, what does that say? It's funny, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. I'm no different than anybody else. You know, I was, there's nothing that makes me special. I just work hard. You know, I have, we all have our attributes. Some of us are good at a lot of things. Some of us can lift weights and grow muscle really easy. Some of us can jump really high and play basketball. Some of us are good at math. Some of us are good at English. We're all good at something. It's a matter of applying that and, and going for it, you know? And, and I, don't think, I don't think anybody in this world has the right to be or feel that they're better than anybody else. I really don't. And I don't know, it's not a, bibli it's not a biblical sense, like, oh, we're all created equal. Yeah, I think we are all created equal. You know, we all started at conception. We were all born in some way, and here we are. It's what we do after that and the choices we make. And you can look and say, oh, well, you look at my like my background. You know, you could say that you know kids from a, a drug, alcohol abusing household are more likely to follow that path. Again, it's up to you whether you want to follow that path or not. It's up to you whether you want to work hard or not. It's up to you whether you want to leave a legacy of greatness or not. 
and I don't like leaving that to chance or to anybody else to make that decision. That's my decision. That's your decision. You know, if you fuck up in life, try again. You know, there's no one I've met, like, and there was a guy, when I lived in California, I, I tried to mow my lawn. It was like this big, and I sucked. Somehow I fucked it up. And there was a dude, he was, he literally, he'd start with one house. Immigrant from Mexico, his name was Carmen Diostado. Never forget him. Somehow he mowed my lawn in like five minutes. It looked beautiful. He started with nothing. By the time I moved, four years later, the man was running an organization with 10 workers under him. He built one lawnmower into that. He had that work ethic. And you find that a lot of first generation or you know, brand new Americans do that, is that they have that work ethic because they realize this is the fucking land of opportunity. It's just a matter of if you take that opportunity by the balls and twist it. A lot of people just aren't willing to grab the balls. That was a horrible metaphor but it sounded good in my head at the time. <laughs> Come on, I have no script here. I wasn't grabbing pussies, I was grabbing balls. <laughs> Chelsea was here yesterday. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your advice when it comes to gauging, gauging trends within an industry? Gauging trends within an industry? Yeah. Well, there's a couple things you could do. You could just watch what's growing. Um, Google searches, <laughs> those are great. Um, Google searches, um, what people are, what's trending, things like that. It depends on the industry. Or you can start your own trend. There's a couple ways to go about it. I mean, certainly in clothing, watch the fashion shows. In uh, supplements, obviously when intro workout, nobody wanted a piece of branch change when I started it. Nobody wanted any of that market. They were expensive to make. The margins were at 20% maximum because it wasn't affordable at the time because no one was making it. So the cost to produce it was exorbitant. Once we got the cost down through us producing more, everybody jumped into that trend. Now it, the, 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 the category's gotta be worth a couple hundred million. So, I mean, you can gauge trends by seeing what's working, but the key is to success, not necessarily jumping on a trend, is to become a trend, and that's very hard to do. And you're gonna fail trying to catch that trend. You're gonna fail trying to start a trend. I wish I came out with skinny pants. These cost $190. I'm still insulted by that, but I already tried them on, I was committed. <laughs> and I had to go somewhere the next day where I needed to. And I had no pants that day. So does that answer that question a little bit? It's, it's a really tough question. Yeah, but then, so what would be your advice on becoming a trend? Though? Honestly, you just have to shoot at the wind. I mean, have your research, maybe some fashion, let's say your clothing, some fashion show in France um, shows that, you know, they're, they're showing this open chest and whatever shirt for women. Maybe you go off that. Maybe, maybe you're noticing that people are, 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 you know, old trends are coming back. Maybe the bell bottoms are coming back, you know? It's just a matter of being very um, in tune to your market, being an expert on your market. Uh, for our market, I'm noticing, like the trend I'm noticing, is a devolution. I think people are going back to the staples and the basics because they're tired of being ripped off on bullshit. Which is good for me because I hate bullshit. So does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a hard question to kind of, there's no right answer. There's a lot of answers, but I think that's the best answer. You have to be very, um, intuitive and in what's going on in the industry and also you have to have good guesswork. And if you're an inventor, just make something and hope people like it. <coughs> I like the, uh, what was that, uh, fucking Segway? Everybody just went to the automotive right now. <laughs> that trend, that's a trend that failed. They thought it'd be the coolest thing ever, right? Nah, not really. <laughs>